Well, hello again, CactusCon. Ryan with the CactusCon crew here with you once again. And I have the distinguished honor from playing the MC to CactusCon 9 of introducing our keynote speakers. We're about to introduce our keynote speaker for day one. But first, we're going to hear from some of our partner level sponsors. Please note that without our sponsors, this conference simply just would not be possible. So let's all take a listen and see what they have to say. Hi, this is Pat Flynn, head of recruiting with Bishop Fox. We're proud to sponsor this year's CactusCon and hope you're enjoying the presentations. Even though this year's experience is different, it's still one of the best CactusCon conferences we've ever had. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to meeting you in our Discord channel. All right, and we are back. It pleasures me to be able to introduce to you our keynote speaker for day one of CactusCon 9, Eva Galbrin. Eva has worked with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, or EFF, since 2007. During her tenure with the EFF, Eva has focused primarily on protecting, helping to protect, the privacy and the security of those in underserved populations, those who simply normally wouldn't realize they can be afforded those protections. Her work in this realm is more than commendable, and we are very excited to have her with us today. Enough of me. It's time to listen to Eva and see what she has to say to us. So we move now to Eva's keynote speech entitled, How to Build a Threat Lab. Hi there, my name is Eva Gelperin and I am the Director of Cybersecurity at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, I am here to talk to you a little bit about how to build a snowman, I mean, a threat lab. Uh, welcome everybody to CactusCon, the play along at home edition. Uh, as you can see, we are currently at the EFF office slash my apartment. And uh, out of deference to, to tradition, I am wearing a gown, but because these are quarantine times, I am also wearing fuzzy slippers. So uh, enough about my sartorial choices, let's, uh, let's talk threat labs. Uh, so usually around this time, uh, I ask everybody uh, to raise their hand if they know what EFF is. And in this case, that will not be happening. So I'm just going to assume that some people raise their hands, that some people aren't entirely sure what EFF is, that some people assume that we are a t-shirt and sticker company, especially if you have been to a conference where EFF has a heavy presence and everybody is wearing EFF t-shirts and no one will explain to you what they mean. Uh, if you go to DEF CON in Las Vegas, you will see that EFF is essentially the closest thing that hackers have to a, uh, to a religious organization. Uh, but uh, we, we have actual goals. We are, we are a real thing and we do things other than uh, making uh, clever t-shirts and stickers. Uh, we are a digital civil liberties organization. And our goal is to make sure that when you go online, your rights come with you. Uh, EFF has been around since 1990. Uh, I have not. I was not there in 1990. I've been working at EFF since uh, 2007, which was uh, a long enough time ago. And uh, from the very beginning, EFF was an organization that was envisioned as a way of speaking tech to power. Uh, even back in 1990, when the internet existed, but the web was sort of in its nascent state, uh, we had a, a couple of incidents that, uh, that led our founders to believe that the government was not very good at understanding the internet, uh, at where data was going and how data was going there. And as our lives have become increasingly digital, uh, that there was a risk that we would lose our, our rights to, to privacy and to security, our right to own the things that we buy and tinker with them 
our right uh, to speak freely and to speak anonymously and to be able to communicate with one another in, uh, in a way that is safe and that is uh, safe specifically from government eavesdropping. Um, furthermore, we understood that this wasn't just going to be the US government that was a problem. Uh, a lot of the time, if you're talking about digital civil liberties and you're okay with the US government having certain powers in order to spy on bad guys or pedophiles or terrorists or pedophile terrorists, which I understand are a very serious problem, uh, you might not be okay with uh, the Chinese government using the same powers on uh, the residents of Xinjiang. Uh, or uh, you might not be okay with the Ethiopian government using those powers and that technology to spy on dissidents who are living in Washington, D.C., or the Russian government using it to spy on supporters of Alexei Navalny or any of uh, Putin's other uh, sort of political opponents. Uh, you might not be okay with the UAE or Saudi Arabia having these powers, with countries with extremely bad human rights records that use these powers in order to identify people, prevent them from speaking, and sometimes, as in the case of our uh, research in Syria, you will see that they, that they use these powers to find dissidents and bring them to torture centers and kill them. So there is a very strong link between the things that we do online and the things that happen to us in the real world. I, in fact, there was a, a documentary uh, that came out several years ago about the Pirate Bay, and I think it was Peter Sund who got up in front of a court and said that he was really offended by the term IRL, by the, the notion that there is a separation between the things that happen online and the things that happen in real life. And increasingly, our digital life is our real life. And as a result, uh, EFF's issues have really moved from the periphery, from being a bunch of what uh, the British call boffins, from being you know tech nerds who get stuff stuffed into lockers, to being at the at the center of everyone's lives. Um, most people uh, have some sort of access to technology and some sort of experience with technology every day. Uh, we have cell phones. We are carrying tracking devices around in our pockets. Uh, we post to social media where a, uh, a company controls the platform and decides who can and cannot speak, uh, largely according to its own terms of service. Uh, we have uh, you know, services and, uh, and consumer goods advertised to us. Uh, at all times, sometimes uh, in ex especially insidious ways that, uh, that we are not aware of. And uh, EFF is there to make sure that your right uh, to privacy, to security, to free speech, to anonymity, to tinker with the stuff that you bought, uh, to be creative, uh, still exists. And it's really under threat. Uh, it is increasingly under threat with, uh, with every passing year. So we found that our issues have really moved from the periphery uh, to the center of everyone's lives. So I am going to talk a little bit about the, the three ways in which EFF usually uh, approaches these issues. So when all you have is a, is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So EFF has a sort of diverse toolbox for dealing with digital civil liberties issues because uh, different problems require different approaches. So we have uh, people who work for us who are lawyers and we do what is called impact litigation. Usually at this point, I would also reach out and uh, ask the audience who here knows what impact litigation is. And some people would raise their hands and some people would not raise their hands. And then I would try to ex explain impact litigation uh, relatively quickly. Um, most people are familiar with the American Civil Liberties Union or the ACLU. Uh, the ACLU does impact litigation in the sense that they take on cases that they think are going to create good precedent or that are going to allow them 
to strike down bad precedent. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is uh, to create an environment in which uh, we have greater legal protections and to sort of push the, uh, the um, borders of civil liberties out rather than having them shrink. And this means that we have lawyers and that they have lawyers that take on cases, but that we take on cases that uh, we're, we're not merely representing our client, um, but we think that the outcome of this case is going to have an impact beyond that client, that it's going to have an impact on a large number of people, that it's going to impact the way that judges decide future cases, the way that legislation is drafted in the future, and the conversation around a particular issue. So that, those are often the reasons that we get involved. Um, when I go to hacker conferences, it's really common for people to think of EFF as sort of um, hacker lawyers. In, in the sense that if you have questions about your security research or if you get into trouble doing your security research or doing responsible disclosure, often uh, EFF's lawyers are the people that you will call. Uh, we don't often end up directly representing security researchers, but we advise them really often. Uh, and to that effect, we have a program called Coders' Rights and you can contact info at eff.org and they will put you through to the coders rights attorneys and uh, if you have questions about how to go about your research in a way that will keep you from getting sued how to release your research in a way that will keep you from getting sued uh, and also what to do when the target of your research uh, or a platform on which you are releasing your research or something uh, associated with your research uh, starts threatening you legally. So there, there are a lot of things that we do along those lines. So we have this, uh, this sort of floor of uh, very angry and talented uh, attack lawyers. I'm very excited about them. Uh, they have done things like uh, sue the US government a lot. Um, specifically, uh, EFF is probably best known uh, around the time that I came work to work for them uh, for having sued the uh, NSA uh, over its warrantless wiretapping program. Uh, first, we sued AT&T because we did not have the standing to sue the NSA. And then uh, apparently one of the motivations for uh, Edward Snowden's uh, leaks uh, was that he wanted to help our uh, our lawsuit, and the very first document that was uh, that was released in the Snowden leaks was actually a document that supported our lawsuit uh, against the, against AT and T, and that made it possible for us to go on and sue the NSA for spying on everybody. Uh, we argued that uh, the that uh, mass surveillance is a violation of Americans Fourth Amendment rights uh, and outside of the lawsuit in a sort of a, a broader sense uh, EFF argues that uh, mass surveillance is a violation of everyone's rights it is a violation of fundamental human rights uh, and uh, to that end we have an international department uh, EFF's international team is uh, one of our you know most, most wonderful and sort of growing sectors. And one of the reasons for that is because EFF started out as a primarily US-based organization. And for a very long time, we were thought of as you know, sort of the, those crazy Americans on the West Coast, uh, or sometimes those crazy Americans in DC or Boston, but uh, always people who are concerned with American law, with American companies, and uh, who believed that the way to really change the internet uh, was to influence American law and American companies because so much of the, the internet lives here. Uh, that's not true anymore. Uh, and in fact, that has not been true in many years. And that was one of the reasons why we created our, our, our international team. So uh, EFF has an international team that uh, travels all over the world. Not right now, obviously, uh, but under, under better circumstances, uh, they travel all over the world. They're concerned with policy 
in uh, the world outside of the United States, especially in Latin America. For a very long time, I was a sort of EFF specialist in Eastern Europe and the post-Soviet states. Uh, we're very interested in um, the surveillance state that has been forming in China, in the surveillance state that has been forming in Russia, uh, in uh, surveillance states and sort of uh, creepy behavior among countries that are normally thought to be U.S. allies and therefore don't get as much attention. Places like Saudi Arabia and Ethiopia. Uh, and of course, uh, places that are thought to be, you know, the West, and therefore somehow above criticism of, uh, of their human rights records. So we also are, are looking at places like Canada and looking at policies in the EU and especially uh, EU member states uh, and, uh, and now the UK since it's no longer part of the EU and has uh, some of the most alarming First Amendment law that, or First Amendment free speech law that, uh, that I have ever seen. So we have, uh, we have this international team. Uh, in addition to an international team, we have a team of rabbit attack activists, uh, people whose job it is to get people on the ground, uh, to get people excited about the work that we're doing. Sometimes the answer to a problem is not to file a lawsuit. Sometimes uh, people have to get out and march. Sometimes people need to file a, uh, you know, to, to send an angry letter. Sometimes people need to sign a petition. Sometimes it's necessary for people to you know, do something to their devices or to contact uh, a company or a platform that they're using to explain to them that their users will have no more of this behavior. Uh, sometimes a revolt among the engineers is the, uh, is the best way to go. And this is the, the kind of outreach that I love doing more than anything else because um, companies are not monoliths. Uh, corporations are not monoliths, they are made up of people. And the people who go to CactusCon are those people. The information security uh, sort of um, community is made up of those people. Uh, and we decide what our companies do. Uh, if you take a look at recent behaviors by, by Google and Amazon uh, and, um, and Apple, you will see that the times when they have really made concessions to human rights, uh, to sort of doing the right thing, it has largely been as the result of a uh, revolt among their engineers. Uh, one of the arguments that I hear really often about not speaking up in your job is that tech is not political. And that's simply not true. Everything is political. Everything that you do is political. And as an information security practitioner, your work is especially political. Um, I mean, I, I'm not a person who brings up the, you know, World War II or Nazis or the Holocaust flippantly, um, but not everybody who lived in Germany during World War II was a Nazi, but somebody still had to, you know, build the machines. And if you refuse to build the machines and you refuse to build the software, some of which was built uh, in the United States by IBM, uh, then the work will not get done. It is not as if some other engineer will rise up to take your place. Uh, one of the things that I really want to see engineers do uh, both now and in the future, and some of the best work that we're capable of is changing the norms around what is acceptable. And finally, we have our tech team. And this is the, the team that I am a member of. Uh, sometimes the answer to you know, what, what are you going to do about this, uh, about this great ill uh, on the internet uh, is actually to build an app uh, or a web extension or to explain how encryption works to members of Congress or to give privacy and security advice to people all around the world. Uh, or to sit down with companies and talk to them about how they can provide greater privacy and security um, against uh, authoritarian governments or uh, companies that are you know, screen scraping or anything else that they, they might be concerned about. And also to bring up new concerns, uh, like how they can serve broader communities. 
one of the big problems that we have in uh, the sort of in information security and you know in in tech in general is that we build platforms and we build tools for people like ourselves. Uh, and the majority of people who work in information security are sort of white and middle class and living in what is euphemistically referred to as the West, uh, but I mostly think of as Santa Clara, California. Uh, and that leads to products that work really well for, you know, kind of middle class, straight, cis men who live in Santa Clara, California. Uh, but the world is bigger than that. And uh, other people have other kinds of problems. And if we think of their problems as edge cases, as things that happen, um, you know, as, as exceptions rather than the rule, we build products that simply do not work for them and that let them down in really frightening ways that often have a uh, direct effect on their everyday lives. So that's one of the reasons why the tech team is so important. Um, a few of the, the tech team projects that you might be familiar with uh, include HTTPS Everywhere. Um, a very long time ago, I think five, maybe even six years ago, at the dawn of time, dinosaurs roamed the earth and most of the web was unencrypted. Uh, and so EFF built a uh, web extension that made sure that if a website was uh, capable of using HTTPS, uh, that it would serve its contents uh, over HTTPS by default. Um, since then, thanks to another one of our uh, projects, CertBot, uh, the web is largely encrypted in transit. Something like 80% of all internet traffic uh, is now served over HTTPS. And I'm really excited about that because I remember a time when it was trivial for authoritarian governments and indeed unauthoritarian governments uh, to see what we were doing online. And uh, they spent a lot of time, you know, man in the middling traffic to email or to you know, various, various social media platforms. Um, one of the other uh, things that our tech team has really uh, championed is uh, certificate transparency, uh, because obviously once the governments uh, were no longer able to just man in the middle traffic by, uh, by controlling the telcos, they started man in the middling certificates. They started issuing safe, uh, fake certificates um, in order to uh, decrypt the SSH traffic. And uh, thanks to certificate uh, transparency, that would be visible almost immediately after it happens and people can simply stop trusting uh, the certificate. Probably the most um, noteworthy case of, uh, of that happening was uh, with a, a European company called Digi uh, Diginotar and uh, I think it was Belgium. Uh, so we have, uh, we have our tech team and then within the tech team we have a tiny group of commandos. Uh, there's, there's five of us and, uh, and we are called the Threat Lab. Uh, in, Threat Lab was founded uh, about three years ago uh, by me and, and my colleagues. Uh, and the reason why we founded Threat Lab was that we had found ourselves doing a lot of security research, uh, which was not unusual for EFF. Uh, but the security research that we chose to do was uh, mostly about uh, internet censorship and uh, that led us to do work on, uh, on APTs. So I spent several years uh, studying the behavior and writing reports about the behavior of various advanced persistent threat actors, uh, which is you know, just our fancy way usually of saying governments. Um, I wrote reports about uh, threat actors in Vietnam, uh, in Kazakhstan, in Lebanon, uh, and, and Syria. Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of these, a lot of these things resulted in you know, real physical harm to people, which was one of the reasons that I concentrated on it. Uh, and at the time, the information security world was not really interested in malware that was targeting journalists or activists 
or lawyers or you know, other kinds of dissidents. They were not interested in the, um, in the malware that was targeting people who spoke truth to power. And the reason for that was because um, activists and journalists and, uh, and dissidents of all kinds have no money. Uh, it is a really big deal to write reports about threats to enterprises, especially if you are doing it in order to prove how useful you are uh, to enterprises so that you can sell enterprise software. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why nobody cared if, uh, if somebody was targeting Syrians and uh, sending them off to, to camps to be tortured. Uh, nobody cared if uh, the Ethiopian government was spying on Ethiopian uh, you know, uh, exiles living in Washington, D.C. Uh, no one spent a lot of time worrying about what was happening to uh, you know, uh, Lebanese journalists or activists because it, there was no money in it. Uh, not only was there no money in it, but the, uh, the malware that was targeting them was not very sophisticated. Uh, when you see infosec companies, at least at, at the time, uh, write reports about APTs, they started with APT1, they started with China. Uh, they started with China uh, trying or succeeding at uh, compromising the, the New York Times. There was a lot of interest in Chinese hacking against Google. There was a lot of interest in, you know, sort of uh, in Russian APTs all of a sudden, uh, somewhere around 2016 for some reason. Uh, and now if you go out into a room of non-infosec people, there are actually people who know what, you know, Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear are, who will not just look at you blankly when you say APT28 or APT29. I mean, they're not going to know what APT32 is, but, you know, this is, this is the, uh, an example of how much uh, this, this language has entered the kind of normal person lexicon. Um, but when, when we were first doing this work, that simply wasn't the case. Uh, people did work on, you know, North Korea uh, and uh, sort of other non-Big Five actors, occasionally uh, Israel. But the reason that they did that work was to show off their chops. Uh, because these were, you know, sort of the best, most sophisticated, most, you know, kind of prolific actors in the, uh, in the field, a uh, security company could prove that they were good simply by saying, listen, I, I found Five Eyes. I have, you know, here is Regin, the software which is being used uh, to, to, you know, the malware which is being used by uh, GCHQ, which is uh, the British uh, sort of... Uh, spy agency. Uh, here is the malware which is being used by the CIA or the NSA or, uh, again, the FSB or SVU. Uh, that, is a, that is a flex, as the kids say. Uh, whereas the sort of stuff that I was looking at was actually very simple. And it was very rarely using ODAs. It was often using, you know, straight up phishing, the most, the most basic and, and boring stuff in the universe. But it was effective and it was having a real effect on the, uh, on the lives of, uh, of people in, uh, in authoritarian countries, and often people who had fled authoritarian countries who were still trying to communicate with the people in, uh, in those countries uh, who were trying to do work or speak up to, to power in some way. Um, so we had, we had this kind of work and we, we needed a place to put it. Uh, then we also got interested in uh, sort of other types of, uh, of targets, uh, for example, uh, and other types of technologies. For example, my uh, colleague uh, Cooper Quinton, uh, along with another researcher uh, from, from Google, uh, worked on a project in which he uh, described the ways in which uh, the police were using uh, cell site uh, simulators or IMSI catchers. And at the time, there had been a lot of research done 
on uh, sort of the, the older version of MZ catchers, but there wasn't a lot being done on the kind of next generation and the kind of technology that was being, uh, that was being used at the time. Uh, stingrays, uh, for example, were out of fashion, uh, and we uh, believe that hailstorms were sort of the new hotness. So we spent a bunch of time uh, studying how they worked, and uh, our cell site simulator uh, sort of um, project for, uh, for finding them uh, based on sort of aberrant behavior um, you know, in the, uh, is, is available on GitHub. In fact, all of the software that we write is open source. We take contributions from everybody. Anybody can fork. We're always very, very excited about it. Uh, so if you are looking for a way to get involved uh, with EFF or its projects, I strongly recommend taking a look at our GitHub and, uh, and making some uh, you know, contributions. Uh, if you feel that you are not yet ready for prime time and you are afraid of the judging eyes of, uh, of EFF uh, staff, uh, it's also good to look at the code simply to learn how to do this stuff in the first place. Uh, EFF is really deeply opposed to the notion of gatekeeping. Uh, if we don't inspire uh, new software engineers and we don't uh, inspire new security researchers, then, uh, then there will not be a new generation of people to do this stuff. If we climb up and we just pull up the ladder behind us, uh, then, then no one will come and we will be standing at the top of whatever it is that ladder was allowing us to climb to, wondering why it is so empty. Uh, so I really strongly encourage you uh, to, to take a look at our GitHub. Um, so where were we? Uh, we were on IMSI catchers. So we spent some time talking, talking about that. We published a, uh, a paper on, uh, on how those MZ catchers uh, and cell site simulators work uh, called Gotta Catch Em All because we love Pokemon. And uh, we also worked on some other projects. Um, probably about last year, people became, for some strange reason, uh, very interested in the kind of technologies that police had access to in order to spy on activists inside of the United States, and specifically the kind of technologies that they were using to spy on, uh, on protests and on protest movements. Um, it turns out that you can file freedom of information requests and find out a lot of information about the kind of stuff that, that various local police departments are buying. And so uh, my co colleague, uh, Dave Moss, uh, organized large groups of volunteers, mostly college students, uh, to go ahead and look into, uh, the, uh, to look into these purchases. And we mapped them out. We mapped out the different kinds of technologies and we mapped them out all over the state. And this uh, particular project uh, is called the Atlas of Surveillance. Uh, one of the places that we really emphasized uh, because uh, Threat Lab is so focused on uh, sort of centering the needs of vulnerable populations, uh, was the border, uh, the U.S. border with Mexico. And so we went, uh, we went down to the border and uh, we spent a lot of time looking into the technology which is being used there because technology is being disproportionately uh, used there and it is dis disproportionately being used to, uh, to target people of color to target uh, immigrants, to target uh, refugees, and uh, we're especially concerned about that. So knowing what kind of technology is there is very important. Um, it's also the first step uh, to allowing people to protect themselves from this sort of technology, to protesting the use of these technologies uh, in your sort of immediate vicinity. Uh, one of the, the most interesting bits of activism that EFF has, uh, has done recently uh, has been a campaign against the government use of, uh, of face surveillance technologies. And our suggestion is simply that face, technology, uh, face surveillance technologies and face identification technologies, because they are so bad at what they do uh, and are, are so biased towards misidentifying uh, people of color, uh, that uh, governments should not be using them, and specifically local governments should not be using them. And so we worked with a lot of grassroots organizations and have helped um, to 
uh, sort of create these bans on uh, on the use of facial recognition technology by uh, by police and by governments in uh, in San Francisco, in Oakland, in uh, in um, cities in Massachusetts, and this sort of thing is you know kind of kind of spreading throughout the country, which I am very excited about. Um, and finally, there's there's the work that I'm usually known best for, uh, which was so while I was doing all of this APT work. Uh, I uh, was working with another security researcher who turned out to be a serial rapist. And I uh, was really, really mad. <laughs> and so one of the things that I did uh, after I uh, was, I, I read about it, and I read an interview with one of his uh, sort of survivors slash victims, and she was really scared. One of the, the things that really touched me about this interview was that she was worried that he was going to hack her devices, that he was going to install you know, stalkerware on her phone or on her computer. And uh, apparently he had threatened to do so. And so I tweeted that uh, if there was a woman who had been sexually assaulted by a hacker and was worried about the state of her devices, that she could contact me and that I would make sure that she got, you know, sort of the, the forensics uh, uh, examination that she needed uh, for her device. And this tweet blew up. Uh, and uh, I, in fact, I still, uh, this week, I have been getting somewhere between six and a dozen requests a day, uh, which is a little bit exhausting. Um, but one of the things that I discovered was that most of the time it's not stalkerware. Uh, most of the time people uh, really just need to lock down, lock down their accounts. They need to be able to change their passwords. And generally I found that the problem was much bigger than, than just stalkerware. That it was, a, uh, that our real problem was a belief in the information security field that somehow spying on uh, devices that belong to your spouse or that belong to an ex or that belong to one of your partners uh, in order to discover whether or not they're cheating or to maintain some sort of control over them because you don't trust them is somehow okay. And it's not. So I have been uh, spending a lot of time working on changing that norm and also encouraging AV companies to treat uh, stalkerware as malware, as potentially unwanted uh, programs on people's devices. Um, I also go around uh, talking to companies about the uh, domestic abuse use case uh, in the same way that we spent a lot of time trying to convince people that, uh, that journalists matter and that their safety is not an edge case, uh, and that activists matter and their safety is not an edge case. Women matter and their safety is not an edge case. Uh, survivors of domestic abuse also matter and their safety is not an edge case. Uh, so I have gone around trying to, to talk to companies about how they can kind of domestic abuse proof uh, their products. And one of the big problems that we have in security is that we assume that having uh, the password combined with physical access to the device equals uh, legitimate access to the device. And in the domestic abuse case, that is frequently not the case. So we need to look at, uh, at other ways of establishing legitimate, uh, legitimate access and of being able to lock, uh, lock a user out. Because one of the, the most interesting things about the domestic abuse case is that um, it is not about simply not trusting someone. Often a, uh, a domestic abuser is not somebody who shows up on day one and says, hi, I'm going to control every move that you make and I'm going to have access to all of your devices. Um, they show up looking nice. They show up being polite. They show up being you know, the best thing that ever happened to you and the abuse very slowly creeps in. And so you're moving from a person that you trust very much and that you love very much to a person that you need to lock out of your life ASAP. Uh, and so I have gone around to companies and talked to them about uh, the, the things that they can do to do that. One of the big mandates that I have for companies is I tell them that you need to make it very uh, easy for people to see who has access to their data. Uh, and you need to make it very easy for, uh, for a user 
to lock a, a person out, to move them from trusted to, uh, to a state of untrusted. Uh, so I think that that's especially important. So let's talk a little bit about what you can do, because uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of this talk was really supposed to be focused on uh, how you build a threat lab. Um, EFF's Threat Lab is really not the only organization of its kind. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the work of Citizen Lab in Toronto, but uh, they predate us by many years, and they're sort of the, the OG of doing this kind of, uh, this kind of research. Uh, paired with advocacy, there's uh, Lucy Parsons Labs, which is, uh, is also quite fabulous. Uh, Consumer Reports has opened up a lab and uh, they put out a report just today uh, in which they compared various uh, kind of opt-out services that, uh, that take advantage of California's new privacy laws that allow you to uh, opt out of data collection. Uh, and, uh, and their report is really great. Uh, Amnesty International uh, puts out reports about the uh, malware which targets the, the sort of uh, activists and journalists that they work with. Uh, and again, um, Citizen Lab has done years and years of great work uh, highlighting the way that uh, the, the sort of makers of these technologies uh, are often uh, not people in authoritarian regimes, but uh, you know, uh, information security workers like you and me who work in so-called Western countries, that frequently this technology is built in, uh, in places like Italy and Germany and Israel, uh, which is the home of sort of the, the notorious NSO group. Um, so this is one of the places where uh, people like you and me can make an enormous difference simply by uh, changing the norm so that working for these companies is not okay. So that you know, building the Panopticon is uh, is not okay, and we should not be doing it. Uh, so hopefully, at this point, I've gotten everybody all fired up, and uh, they are uh, trying to figure out what kind of research they can do uh, in order to help uh, to help their their community. And the good news is that uh, everybody has a community that they know. Everybody is from somewhere. Uh, for example, you might look into the uh, security and privacy concerns of, uh, of your family, of uh, your you know, parents or grandparents, and just generally the elderly population who are really being you know, left out in the cold during this quarantine. You might look at the security concerns of students and student privacy right now, especially now that uh, most learning takes place online. And EFF has done some really interesting work in student privacy, especially on the kind of proctoring software, which is very invasive, uh, that, uh, that children have been required to, to put on their devices. And we're very worried about that. Um, so you can do work on student uh, software. You can do work on uh, the concerns of your immediate community, of your school, of, uh, of your church, temple, or coven, depending. Uh, and there is work for everyone to do. Uh, one of the most important things that I would really like people to, to take away from this talk is that you don't need permission to become a security researcher. There is no fairy that comes around and sprinkles glitter on you and tells you you have now been blessed by CactusCon or DEFCON or RSA or anything like that. And now, now my friend, you are a security researcher. The best way to do it is not to wait for permission, uh, though consulting with, uh, with an attorney in advance is a very good idea before publication or before doing your work. Um, including our coders' rights project, but the most important thing is to find a community that you care about and ask them what their concerns are. Find out the ways in which they are being underserved, the ways in which they're being taken advantage of, the ways in which ordinary platforms and, uh, and internet-connected devices and phones and computers are failing them, uh, and start looking into that and just go ahead and publish. Go ahead and publish and I swear I will, the, I will make sure that people read it. I am especially interested in this work. One of the things that I'm really proud of 
uh, with my uh, with my stalkerware work is that it has inspired uh, a number of academics to go out and build their you know sort of PhD theses around uh, around doing research into the domestic abuse case uh, and into ways that uh, IoT devices are being used in, in domestic abuse and ways in which malware is being categorized and ways in which uh, you know this this tracking is taking place and I think that that is really important work uh, that just about everybody here can do uh, so I, I hope that this has been helpful and I would like to see every last one of you go out and build a threat lab.